Hello. And Minneapolis is the east. <laughs> you said two. Yeah, two o'clock. Yeah. I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the UMC at CU Boulder. We're here in the Glenn Miller Central Ballroom. And to all those here with us and also all those out watching the live stream in the virtual netherworld, including my mother in Florida. Hi, Mom. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. My name is Josh Lepree, and I'll be serving as a moderator for this panel. I'm a PhD candidate and an instructor in the sociology department here at the university. Now that I have everyone's attention, I'd like to kindly request that you double check your cell phones, your tablets, your vocal cords and other electronic devices to assure that they're either turned to vibrate or silent mode, please. In case you're wondering exactly where your CWA journey has taken you to now, it's currently 3.30 p.m., Thursday, April 7th, 2016, and we are here together for panel number 4762, titled The Politics of Immigration. To consider this topic today, we have with us a outstanding and distinguished lineup of panelists. Each panelist will have about 10 minutes to offer their remarks, after which we'll have a question and answer session with the audience. And new for this year, as some of you may well know from already participating in some of these panels, is the ability to submit questions either via text message or by writing them on an index card, as opposed to the old style that we've done in the past with the microphones up at the front. Um, so this trial format is motivated by a desire for us to allow our online audience to participate in the Q&A period, and also by a desire to improve the overall quality of the Q&A period at the CWA. If you want to participate in the text question submission format, you'll first need to join the session. In fact, if you think you might ask a question in this session through text message, I'd encourage you to take out your phone now, remember, silent or vibrate mode, please, and to join this session, you'll send a text message to the five-digit number 22333. And this is illustrated on the posters to each side of the stage. In the body of the message, you'll type the keyword UMCGMB. You'll get a confirmation message that you're now part of the session. You'll just reply to that message with your question for the panel when the time comes. If you're a student here at CU Boulder, please make sure to indicate this in your question because students have priority in the question and answer session. If you'd also like your first name and your location to be read aloud, you can include this information in your text as well. Finally, if you, don't, if you do not have a cell phone, please get the attention of a producer here in the room and they can give you an index card and pencil for you to write your question down on. And producers, if you can please now wave your arms so the audience members know how you, who you are. They're here flanking the room and in the back so they can provide you with an index card if you'd like to use that format. I'll go ahead and repeat these instructions again after the panelists make their opening remarks. So without any further ado, let me introduce our group of panelists. From left to right, as you face the stage, we have Michael Frank, who is a graduate of Yale University and earned his JD from Georgetown University Law Center. He has just recently been appointed as the director of Washington, D.C. programs for the Hoover Institute. He is a 13-time veteran of the Conference on World Affairs. And when I asked him why he continues to come back to the CWA, uh, he let me know that he's actually conducting a long-term anthropological study on the indigenous population of Boulder. <laughs> and, and in addition, he mentioned that the complimentary Chardonnay is also enticing. <laughs> on a personal note, Michael is the son of an immigrant. His mother immigrated from Ireland post-World War II, so the topic of this panel has uh, a personal uh, implication for him as well. Next, seated next to Michael, we have Mary Linda Garcia. She is a former four-term member of the New Hampshire State House of Representatives. And she actually began serving in the House of Representatives in New Hampshire in 2006, the same year she earned her bachelor's degree from Tufts University. During her third term, she received her master's of public policy from Harvard University. Um, she also wanted me to note that she actually got a double degree at Tufts um, where she, she was also enrolled in the New England Conservatory of Music. She's an accomplished harpist as well, and she's taught music as an adjunct professor at Gordon College and also Phillips Exeter Academy. Mary Linda said that her favorite part about participating in the Conference on World Affairs is being able to hear divergent perspectives on the wide range of topics that are covered. 
She's also here representing the Libre Initiative, which is a policy advocacy, advocacy and educational outreach pro program that's related to economic opportunity. Next we have Judge William Thorne, who received his JD from Stanford Law School. He is a retired tribal and state judge, although he affirms that in his quote unquote retirement, he's actually working harder than he did when serving as a judge. His advocacy work to help improve the lives of children and their families has kept him extremely busy, and he logs nearly 200,000 flight miles per year in doing this work. It is a real treat to have him with us on this panel. And while I asked why he keeps coming back to the CWA, this is his fourth time here, he mentioned the great weather and also the ability to hear multiple perspectives on different issues. And finally, seated next to Judge Thorne, we have Heather Hurlbert. She's the current director of New Models of Policy Change for the organization New America. She's acted also as a speechwriter for Bill Clinton, Madeleine Albright, and Warren Christopher. She said that it's unusual for her as a policy geek to also be an accomplished choir singer. In fact, that's why she was late getting to the CWA, because she was singing uh, in a choir event late Sunday night before she departed for Boulder. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and give our panelists time for their opening remarks. We're going to go in order from left to right, starting with Michael Frank. Thank you, Josh. Um, hello, everybody. I'm seeing some more and more familiar faces out there. <laughs> Gluttons for punishment. That's what I think. Or groupies. Nah, <laughs> gluttons for punishment, I think. This is my archaeological study thing here. Um, okay, immigration, uh, let me give you some personal connections to it uh, professionally. I mentioned already that my mom uh, is an immigrant who came here from Ireland after uh, World War II. Um, our home was always full of immigrants over the dinner table, and mostly from Ireland, but from a lot of other places as well. And if you can imagine growing up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, 60s and 70s, um, it was pretty much a uh, polyglot, uh, you know, the most grand mosaic. You know, every block was different. Manhattan had neighborhoods that were six blocks here would be suddenly old Czech and then these Ukrainian neighborhoods. And today is a whole bunch of different countries. The Irish neighborhoods are now Korean and so on. Uh, so when you come from New York City, immigration kind of is second nature, I think. And it's, it's, you think of it as a normal part of life's background noise. It's just always there. Um, professionally, I've been on the Hill three different times. And whether it's by coincidence or not, each time <clears throat> we had a major immigration bill. One was in 1990, and I was working for a member on the House Judiciary Committee. Um, and that went fairly smoothly. It was a big bill, took a long time, but it was uh, um, fairly, com compared to today's kinds of, of controversies, it was not that big of a deal. Then in, in uh, 1996, I was there, uh, very, very tail end of the uh, session, and there was a big immigration bill that uh, I was working for the House Majority Leader, worked on that for the last few weeks of session. And that was probably the last thing we had to get done before we, we uh, uh, adjourned. Uh, and back then we adjourned actually in September before the end of the fiscal year, got all the appropriations bills done. It was a different kind of time. And then more recently, when I was working for the current House Majority Leader, Kevin McCarthy from California, uh, I had portfolio, I was policy director, but I had a specific portfolio that included uh, immigration. Uh, and so I had the Judiciary Committee portfolio. And so one of the things we did <clears throat> is we put together what we thought would be a good kind of unifying set of uh, core principles for immigration reform that would be unveiled to uh, all the House Republican members at the annual Republican retreat. And if you don't know, in January, the uh, Democrats go off to some place and they have a, like a two-day caucus retreat where they lay out you know, priorities for the year, agenda items, they bring in speakers and so on, and Republicans do the same thing. And uh, usually the House members do it on their own, <clears throat> but more recently it was actually one where the Republicans, uh, House members, and senators all decided to get together, which was a great uh, gesture, a magnificent gesture on the part of the Senate, um, you know, to mingle with us lowly House people. Um, and we unveiled it, and it turned out that not many of the members had read it. It wasn't all that long. <laughs> they didn't really read it. They didn't pay attention to it. And then everyone came in and started, you know, bringing back some of their core concerns. And in some ways, you know, one of the reasons why immigration has become so controversial is 
uh, in my mind. You know, the, 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 you hear about it a lot in talks of things like trade policy, where there's concentrated harm and dispersed gain, and it's really hard to think about the, the resolve sometimes an issue when all the, the harm is concentrated like in one closed factory in which people can see and feel, and it, it's in the neighborhood. A certain community really is affected by that, and the dispersed gain of having access to global goods at lower prices uh, is actually you can probably measure it somehow and say people benefit, but day to day you just don't feel it because the, the benefits are so dispersed across so many different things uh, and you just don't realize it. Immigration has kind of become like that. If you look at polls, the uh, consistently, if you look at things like path to citizenship or legal status or uh, more immigrants or less immigrants or immigrants good for America or not, uh, you get majorities uh, saying pretty much, yeah, immigrants are good for America, they work hard, they're uh, beneficial overall. Uh, we don't, do you want more or less or, or about the right or the same number today? A lot of people say they want more immigrants, more immigrants coming in. Um, even the things like uh, some of the specific policy ideas, you know, having more, uh, when, when foreign students come to the United States and get graduate degrees, should they be given some kind of quicker path to citizenship? Overwhelming majorities will say yes to that. Um, so it's kind of like this overall sense of we want to do a lot of these things, but then when you get into the nooks and the crannies of the legislating, you find that is that the uh, a couple of the issues are so intensely felt <clears throat> by certain categories of uh, of members that it's hard to get off the dime. It's hard to get anything really uh, advancing, and and then there's these tactical decisions that each party makes. So. Uh, Mary Linda and I were talking earlier that there, you know, there are a lot of bills like ag worker reforms and H-1B visas and some of the high tech uh, issues where, such, a, such as the one about college or graduate students being able to you know, get on a fast track, that um, overwhelming bipartisan support, look, the bills that are introduced are you know, high numbers of co-sponsors from both parties, but they can't move somehow. And the reason that you may say, well, why is that? And what happens? is that the Democratic members will say, we don't want to move those bills until we solve the fill in the blank. Usually it's the uh, citizenship issue. And then the, some of the Republican members will say, we don't want to move things incrementally until we fix the border, let's say. So you have those two kinds of outlier positions and, and they, hold, they, they hold everything else hostage to those two, two things. So as a result, even though you might be able to, to fix up a whole lot of the immigration uh, code in the law, uh, as a result, nothing ends, ends up happening. Um, there are some other things I'll just mention that are real big considerations, I think, that play into it. Uh, a lot of, one of the things I did when I was uh, the policy director was we get a lot of people coming up asking for meetings to talk about immigration. And they're usually, uh, you know, associations and they're very, very well versed in some or another part of immigration law. And they have a, a specific request that they want to make sure gets included in whatever comprehensive bill might end up moving. And I decided at one point I was just going to you know, start these meetings <clears throat> by thanking them for coming and then saying, now, let's pull back for a second. I mean, what, what is the purpose of having an immigration code in U.S. law? What's the overriding purpose of it? And you'd be astonished at how many, it's, uh, you know, hmm. I mean, they're experts on H-1B visas. They know everything there is to know about that. But when you ask them that big question, uh, well, let, well, let me think about that. And then we would talk about it a little bit for a while. And I always thought it was pretty instructive to see where people were coming down. So in, in my views, I thought about it more and more. The way I say, why do we have immigration law? For one thing, it is the unique province of the federal government. Uh, it's, the Congress especially has there's some Supreme Court jurisprudence that basically says that there's no area of law that's more squarely within the parameters of the Congress than immigration um, policy. Um, I think you, immigration law is there to serve the national interest of the country that's, on, that's receiving the immigrant. And in the case of the United States, I think it should advance our long-term economic interest and honor our humanitarian traditions and be able to, to do that in a secure way. The people are not going to we're not going to be bringing in um, people with ill will or malice toward the country. And I think every country pretty much around the world, when you look at their immigration policies, uh, generally kind of reflect that. We, I think we tend to be more generous than, than most with respect to uh, over the last you know, 100 plus, 150 years, with respect to how we've brought people into America and assimilated them. And assimilation, 
is an important element too. I think it's important that, you know, when you think about America, we're, we're founded on a set of principles and ideas. You go back and look at the Declaration of Independence and how the Constitutional Convention came about and what the actual uh, language says. Um, we're, we're a, as a Hofstadter, that great historian, you know, mentioned, you know, we are a, a creed. We have an American creed. And, uh, and so I think we are entitled to say to people who want to become American citizens that, you know, we'd like you to, uh, to buy into that. Rule of law, recognize, you know, individual uh, liberties and, and people are born with their, these rights as it's stated in the Constitution and the Declaration. Um, and, and we ought to be able to find ways to, to when somebody wants to become a citizen, to give them citizenship training and some basic education about America. And I think most times that's they, citizens, prospective citizens embrace it. You know, I've been to parties when people have gotten their citizenship and you have the nice, you know, uh, cake with the red, white, and blue, usually strawberries, blueberries, and cream icing, which I love. And, and you just, they, they love it. They're just so thrilled to become Americans. And I think that's something we ought to encourage in the sense of being an American isn't just suddenly changing some paperwork. It's actually buying into something very special. And I think we have every right to be uh, very proud of that. And so all the noise and all the animosity about it today is, uh, is very frustrating to a lot of us because uh, it is a part of our law that's fundamentally broken. Uh, we're not able to enforce a lot of it. Uh, it's caused the current administration to do some things that they really have no legal authority to do and because they get impatient is that if you don't act, we're going to act. And we can talk about that more in the Q&A. But there's some cases that have gone into the courts that have uh, actually stopped some of those actions that um, have been stopped now for over a year. And so that's a, fun a, a, a measure of the frustration. And uh, as true leadership, we find a way to bring people off the, the edge in both terms of the border requirement and the um, uh, citizenship requirement so we can start moving forward, I think, on some things and show that things can get done. Then, then we can tackle the really, really big, annoying problems uh, later. So on that, I'll, I'll stop, and I look forward to your questions. Sorry. Uh, before Mary Linda goes, I just wanted to really quickly remind students, who, if you're texting questions, please make sure you indicate that you're a student. I'm starting to receive some questions. I just want to make sure that I know who's, you know, questions are from a student, which ones aren't. So if you sent one as a student, please resend it with the title student. Just so I'll know to prioritize that in the Q&A. Thank you. Now on to Mary Linda. Okay. Thank you so much for being here and uh, having me. This is my first time at the Conference on World Affairs and I've uh, been enjoying it greatly. So thank you for your good attention and your great questions. Um, I, I really appreciate Michael's comments and thoughts on, on so many areas there, so I'll try not to retread uh, some of the ground he covered. But um, basically, I, I think we can all agree that immigration is an extremely serious issue. And again, to Michael's point, we are a sovereign nation. And when it comes to an issue that so seriously affects um, our economy and, frankly, our national fabric now and in the trajectory of our country in years to come, it's really important that we be very serious-minded about it, consider all options, and really find consensus and work together. Um, in his introduction, he mentioned I was a state legislator um, I was in New Hampshire, so, and obviously dealing with a lot of state policy, so immigration didn't come up that often, as uh, people would joke, you know, the Canadians really aren't uh, doing much <laughs> in terms of, you know, coming into New Hampshire. We had a few instances where some people uh, were out mushroom hunting in areas they weren't supposed to be, but that was about the most uh, serious nature of uh, what we had to think about. And it's pretty clear that in the national consciousness, um, most of the debate is focused around um, the Southwest, and that makes perfect sense. You know, we have 11.2 approximately um, um, illegal immigrants, and 82% of them are from uh, South and Central America, and so naturally we want to be sure that we're considering um, 
their concerns and, and our concerns and trying to really be sure that we're just not firing off in all kinds of directions. But after um, serving uh, four terms in the state legislature, I did uh, run for Congress in New Hampshire. And so naturally, um, it was incumbent upon me to address federal issues um, and you know expand the scope of things beyond um, just kind of the immediate concerns of my state. And wouldn't you know, what I found was that there's a very unfortunate um, way of talking about this in the national debate. It seems it's though, as though, and so many of the contentious issues of our time, immigration being one of them, they're contentious because in the media, in debates, and sort of what results of what should be a reasoned substantive debate is always something that's driven to the marginal extremes on either side. So to the casual observer, you would think that the only two possible policy reforms, if you will, on the table that can even be considered are mass deportations or blanket amnesty. And in fact, there's so much more in between um, that could be done in terms of actual positive reforms and, frankly, in areas that have so much consensus from so many Americans, industry, and even um, elected officials. But somehow that um, never really cuts through. And um, so I think that's really unfortunate in just the political discourse. And um, part of that does come from, you know, the questions that elected officials are, are asked and kind of where the discussion is driven. And, and that's really sad. Um, they're pitted against each other, again, on those uh, marginal um, uh, sides and, or, excuse me, in the margins. So I, I personally would love to see that change. But um, within that, one would wonder, okay, if there's so much frustration about congressional d gridlock on this issue and things not getting done, why is that? And if, again, if you think about it, you always hear about this, uh, any effort that's made by Congress is always comprehensive immigration reform. So that means it's sweeping legislation that covers, you know, all areas. But the problem is, if it's presented by one party or the other, there are always mixed in with the good ideas that everyone can agree on. There's always some sort of poison pill, you know, again, uh, deportation issues, uh, amnesty issues. And so one side or the other, frankly, can agree, you know, to certain measures and nothing gets done. So that to me brings up the issue of comprehensive versus the incremental approach to immigration. And I would love to see um, our elected officials, if there really is any way uh, to cut down on, you know, the partisanship and, and the thing that drives the discussion in that way, and that um, actual incremental reforms could be accomplished. And, you know, there are a number of areas um, that could be done, but two um, big ones are um, in the visa process and in border security. Um, you know, I, I really do think that visa reform should stand alone um, as an inc incremental reform measure when it comes to the H-2A and uh, H-2B visas having to do with um, the agricultural and seasonal workers. There's so much um, that could be done that could really uh, jump start the process into other areas when it comes to high skilled labor as well. Um, we can talk to all of the various industries, understand their needs, look at the long term trends in terms of our economy and, you know, what it is that we need to supplement uh, American interests and, and um, our American workforce. And that would be an excellent um, way to go about it. And the other one, of course, is, yes, border security, where if we don't know, you know, who's coming into our country and going out of our country, that's, that's a big problem. Um, how can we really realistically uh, implement any other reforms if we don't even have a handle of, you know, what it is we're dealing with? So um, one, again, simple uh, thought there has to do with the entry and um, exit um, visa monitoring, where we would know, again, who's exiting the country, who's coming in, um, people who that are overstaying their visas, those that um, are, are on the other side. So, and, and that's a safety issue too. In the last number of years, we've had approximately 17,000 um, children um, from Central America uh, coming in. And unfortunately, given the fact that there are so many uh, parts of the border, particularly 
particularly in the Rio Grande area, um, where we don't know exactly what's happening. Those children, it's a safety issue for them as well. Many of them are subject to trafficking and abuse and um, slave labor in many instances. So again, it has to do with our national interest, but it also has to do with the experience of those um, that are uh, coming into the country one way or another. So um, I would personally would love to see that occur in terms of incremental reforms. And again, those are just um, two of the main areas. And the fourth thing I just want to say is it would be nice too if um, there were more appetite or air, I guess, for um, there to be a little outside of the box thinking. Um, a lot of people seem to give credit, you know, to one candidate or the other to, you know, uh, bringing this issue to the national attention, and in fact, it's it's that's not the case. There have been so many uh, laws and attempts, you know, at reform. Again, maybe uh, destined to failure for some of the reasons I mentioned, but really, we have been talking about it for a long time, for many years. But it doesn't really seem, uh, you know, to to move the ball forward in a lot of ways. So, you know, in just doing some independent reading and you know research on it, there are all kinds kinds of um, thoughts on it from different think tanks and whatnot. And one, for example, is something that works so well um, in the states when you think of them as uh, labs of innovation. And if you do support, as I do, the concept that um, governing does work best when it's closest to the people that it's seeking to serve. So it, within the state uh, government in, um, environment and jurisdiction, um, elected officials tend to be very close to their constituents, very close to their industries, understand you know their specific industries. You know, Texas and New Hampshire do not have <laughs> the same industries, right, um, and concerns. So why not, as they do in other countries, allow the states to experiment, you know, with different programs that um, help them and meet their citizens' needs and their economic needs, and then we could share that, you know, from one state to the other. So, so state systems, I think, would be a great um, thing to, to hear more about. And then the other is maybe even when we're talking about, you know, legalization, um, why not even consider a multi-tiered method? You know, people talk about uh, when Reagan, for example, passed his amnesty bill. Well, did you know that only 45% of those eligible, you know, under that um, change even opted to become citizens? And that's because, frankly, not everybody that is here um, without, um, you know, documented or legal status actually wants to become a citizen. You know, obviously if it's great if people do and go through the process the right way, but some people really do just want to work here um, and, you know, provide for their families, and there's ways that can be adopted. So why not consider um, different, um, sort of a multi-tiered uh, approach to legalization? Um, some for example, just involving a permanent uh, renewable work permit, uh, permit another one, maybe a permanent green card, and then you know the third, which I, I do think it's important to note, if it if it is something that will lead to citizenship, let's be sure that that is of course the one that um, requires the most and uh, doesn't um, unfairly advantage those who uh, did come here through an unlawful process through those that have been trying for many years within our broken system to do it the right way. So those are just um, some thoughts and um, I, I think, you know, again, it's a very important issue and um, as with so many other issues we deal with, it would be great if the level of rancor um, we're not as it is, and uh, we would be open to real, you know, substantive ideas, and not just have these uh, arguments on on the extremes. But anyway, I, I look forward to your questions, and I'll I'll conclude with that. Thanks. Just before we started, Michael reminded me why I'm probably on this panel because I make no ex no claim to expertise in immigration issues at all. Uh, I'm Pomo and Costa Miwok Indian from Northern California. And from my point of view, you're all illegal immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be what I want, but I gotta live with it. <laughs> yeah. 
When I was in school, I was taught the notion and understand that the time this was explained to me, I had a very hard time swallowing this. But I was taught that what made our country great were the waves of immigrants who came in with sweat, hard work, ideas, and a, and a desire to build a better life. Now that was hard for me to accept because we were already here. And it's not like we lacked any of those things. But even that notion of what made this country great now seems to be tossed aside with the notion that we got ours, you're too late, and tough luck. I, I have a hard time reconciling those notions, and maybe they're irreconcilable. But I view myself as a child advocate, and so let me give you a couple of examples that I've seen uh, of the impact of this inability to uh, come to a rational resolution of this issue. Uh, my daughter uh, was teaching fifth grade in a, a private Catholic high school, and she called me up in tears because the mother of one of her fifth grade students, a little girl, the mother was arrested uh, because of her Ill illegal immigration status. Uh, and she had just taken the little girl down to the jail to visit her mom. And she didn't know how to console that little girl. Mom was working, paying taxes. The little girl was in private school. Uh, to all intents and purposes, she seemed to be what we want from neighbors. I won't even say citizens, I'll say neighbors. What we would want from neighbors. Uh, another example. One of the last cases I had on the Court of Appeals, uh, in which I filed a dissent because I couldn't even get any of my colleagues to agree with me, involved a young teenager, illegal immigrant mother, single, who had a baby prematurely. She hurt the child in her frustrations. System came in and took the child. She did everything that everybody asked. She went through the counseling programs. She worked with a, a social worker to build a support network. She knew where to go for help. At the conclusion, virtually everybody who worked with her agreed that she was going to be a very good mom. Maybe not perfect. I don't know if there are that many perfect moms out there, other than mine. <laughs> but everybody agreed that she was going to be a very good mother. And the system terminated her parental rights. They cut her away permanently from her child. Because in my state, unfortunately, in independent grounds for terminating parental rights is failure to meet the contract that you sign when they take your kids. They take your kids, they draft all the things you're supposed to do, and you sign it. And in the boilerplate of that agreement were two things that she had not done. One was get a job. She's an illegal immigrant. She can't work legally. If she had worked, she'd violate another provision of the co contract, which was don't break any laws. And she didn't pay child support while the child was in foster care. Those, those were her flaws, and on the basis of that, they took her child. And I couldn't get anybody to, to understand. Legally, the bases were covered. They had a legal cover to doing it. But in my mind, there was something just absolutely unethical about taking a child away from a mother who was capable of taking care of her. Last example I want to use. When I teach around the country about Indian boarding schools, one of the slides that I use to denote the attitude towards children that are different than you uh, pops up. 
and it's a pair of handcuffs, literally this big. They're in the Haskell Indian School Museum. And in the course of digging into this, I discovered that they, they actually took kids as young as four. So what kind of a mindset do you need to think that you need handcuffs of this size? Well, it turns out that, at least in some instances, five and six-year-olds, when they're detained by ICE, immigration control, and they're housed in a facility, when they come to court, they're in shackles. Not just handcuffs, but their ankles are shackled as well. And what kind of a mindset do we have when that's the process? And I don't, I'm not suggesting I have the answer to anything, but I would suggest that we've forgotten that humanity needs to be a part of this discussion and this argument and this decision. So that these are real people and despite what one of the candidates says, they're good neighbors. They're the kind of neighbors I would like to have, to have my grandkids grow up around. Uh, so I would just might like to make a plea. I don't pretend to understand the politics, so Michael explained things that I didn't understand before just now, so I've learned something. But I just want to make a plea for common sense and humanity as we're trying to find a solution to this. Because these are the lives of real people. They're not just those others. Thank you. Judge, you're a rough act to follow. <laughs> um, I want to thank Michael, and I'll also start out by uh, reminiscing a little bit about my family background. Um, my family's been here a long time on all sides. We, uh, we, uh, we have a lot of uh, what we call white privilege these days. Um, I have some ancestors who came over on a ship that left before the Mayflower. It leaked, so it turned around. Lost, <laughs> lost my bragging rights. Uh, so that's one way you can describe my family. Um, another way you can describe my family is that everybody who came over here was either um, a member of a religious minority that states considered dangerous, a draft dodger, or um, uh, I'm just forgetting how I feature the last ones, uh, or an Indi and in somebody who was um, skipping out on a contract he didn't like. Um, I've got an ancestor who actually jumped ship. <laughs> um, so, so we got crooks, we got dangerous religious minorities, we got draft dodgers. Um, and that's my, that's my fabulous wasp mayflower roots. So, so that's, that's my family's story about what it means, what it means to be, to be an American immigrant. Um, it's pretty hard to go last on this panel. So I thought I would um, just introduce a couple of interesting, um, because again, this is another one of these areas where things have shifted quite a bit in the last 10 years in ways that maybe those of us who have been around these arguments for a while don't necessarily realize. And there's some really interesting dynamics and divisions within the American population that I actually think go a long way to explaining some of the gridlock that Michael and Mary Linda talked about. So um, first fun audience quiz, what proportion of the U.S. population is foreign born today? Uh, how many people think it's less than 10 percent? How many people, th okay, we got a couple. How many people think it's less than 20 percent? Okay, how many people think it's more than 20 percent? Actual answer is 14 percent. So, um, and that is not the highest it's ever been. Um, with respect, but it's getting towards other peak moments of immigration in, in our history. And we know that those peak moments of immigration were also matched by peak moments of public fear, hatred, violence against newcomers. So there's some way that what we're seeing now is, is a, gr a repeat of a great and not so great American story. And the good news about this American story is that it has, it has had very positive outcomes in the past. So, for example, you may remember a few years ago, there was an extensive controversy about whether to build a mosque near the site of 9-11 in New York City. One of the bits of history that brought out that maybe people didn't know, that I didn't know, 
was that um, in the wealthy Connecticut counties where the folks who worked down in that part of Manhattan tended to live, Catholic churches were not permitted until well into the 20th century. And why were Catholic churches finally permitted when the first ones were permitted? What was the liberal argument for allowing in a Catholic church? The maids had to have somewhere to go to church. So, you know, there really, in one level, there really is, is very little new about this experience. Um, and we can be hopeful, as I think other panelists have been, that, that ultimately we're going to survive and um, assimilate and grow from this wave of immigration just as we have from the ones before it. Now, my next fun quiz question, uh, what, are the th what were the three sending countries that sent the most immigrants to the U.S. last year? Uh, in status and out of status. Anybody want to guess? You can yell them out. I heard China. I heard Mexico. I have, that's really interesting. China and Mexico are two of the three, and I haven't heard the third yet. India. What's particularly interesting is if you look at the Pew data, which is generally regarded as the most reliable, their, their number on out-of-status folks is, is the one Mary Linda used, they think that the numbers of Indian and Chinese immigrants actually now match the numbers of Mexican immigrants, which is a huge shift over what we were looking at 10 years ago. So that's something else to think about, that, that um, what and who are our immigrant populations is really changing. Um, third point I want to make is a little deeper dive into some survey data because here again, um, you know, what's fascinating is on the one hand, you get I think 60 or 62 percent support overall for a path to citizenship for folks who are already here out of status. And in a society as divided as we are across as many things, that's a pretty impressive number. And on the issue that, um, that you all identified correctly as one of the most divisive and the most problematic in Congress, you have a, a a pretty reasonable majority. Now, what you see is there are dramatic splits. Maybe the most dramatic split that operates across every other dynamic is age. Um, older folks are much less certain that immigrants bring something positive to America than younger folks are. So if you are a politician who is under the impression that you draw a lot of your support from older voters, you're maybe going to be less positive. Um, similarly, there's a breakdown by ethnicity, which is kind of interesting. Um, Asian Pacific Islanders and Hispanics, more than two-thirds say immigrants are net positive. They bring good things to our country. African Americans, it's a majority, but it's not as strong a majority. Whites, it's less than half who think that immigrants bring something positive, bring a net positive to our country. So again, depending on where you, as an elected official, who you, who you, who you perceive your constituents as being, you're going to have, you're going to have a different set of view on this. Similar along religious lines, this is really interesting. You have, and within religion breaks down by age, but you do have the one religious subcategory that is majority negative on immigrants is white evangelical Protestants. Evangelical Protestants of color are net positive, which suggests that it's, it's the race that's driving the issue and not the faith that's driving the issue. But again, if you're a politician and that's your base, then you are, you are faithfully reflecting the will of your base when you go to Washington and you block progress on these issues. Now, before it sounds like I'm just having fun um, saying mean things about the Republican base, um, I want to stress that within both parties, there are, you know, so you look at Republicans, older Republicans are much more negative than younger Republicans. Older Democrats are much more negative than younger Democrats. Whiter Democrats are much more negative than Democrats of color. So, you know, both parties have these important internal divisions which they have tried to deal with very much as Mike and Mary Linda depicted by picking out issues that are accept that are more acceptable to their own party coalitions. And in the Democratic Party, the issue that's that everyone has bought into, although not after quite a bit of internal struggle, is the path to citizenship. So that's the but when you get in as as they both know very well, when you get into H1B visas, when you get into skilled visas, um, frankly when you get into <laughs> 
uh, seasonal visas, that's where you do have important coalition elements within the Democratic Party who see that immigration as an economic threat. And so it's that, you know, both sides have this kind of internal coalition problem that has, that has slowed reform. A um, couple more points I want to make at the end. One is um, a slightly different take on, Judge, some of the things you said. One of the most dismaying things about the tone of this conversation, as Marilinda said, is that every time we have a spike in debate around immigration, we have a spike in anti-immigrant violence. Um, and this isn't, you know, some people when they see hate crimes say, oh, it's just someone yelling a mean name. It's not. It's, it's kids getting gunned down in front of their mothers. It's women in hijab having their hijabs ripped off. It's taxi drivers being shot. Um, and you can look, you can look at the, there are good statistics on this, um, but anecdotally, um, you can also talk to American Muslims who say it's harder to be a Muslim kid today than it was right after 9-11. And, you know, when you think about that in the context of the generally optimistic picture I tried to paint, that we've been through these challenges before, we've integrated as a society, we've always been stronger for it, that's really, really worrying to me. So I'll just pause with one final note, um, which is, Mary Linda, I, the state level experimentation is not something I really thought about much before, before you said it. And my first thought honestly was, oh, well, that's ridiculous because entry and exit into the country is a federal function. What on earth is she talking about? But then I thought about it some more and I thought, no, actually, you're right. And it's a really interesting point. And I live in the great state of Maryland. And in fact, Maryland um, and a number of other states, I believe Colorado, you know, some of the, the state level experimentation that Maryland has done includes um, passing its own version of the DREAM Act and um, giving in-state tuition to undocumented children who make it through our, our high schools and also driver's licenses to out of status folks so that they have identification, can get jobs, pay taxes, and be productive citizens. So those are two bits of state level innovation that, um, that I would never have thought of describing that way. And indeed, they, I don't know if they're ones you agree with or not, but it's a really interesting thing, thing to think about. And I'll just, because um, I gotta find something optimistic to say on this topic, because I, <laughs> like you, I can't, I, now that you brought up the tiny handcuffs, I can't get them out of my mind. So that's my little bit of optimism to end with. Thanks so much to our panelists. Before we go into the question and answer, I want to give our panelists a little bit of time to engage in some dialogue and respond to each other's remarks. Okay. Uh, let me say two things real quick. Um, one, I mentioned that I would worked on immigration legislation in 1990, 96, and then more recently in 2014, uh, 13 and 14. Um, one thing I noticed in that over that period is how the issue is received in Congress um, at a kind of a 101 level in that in 1990, and I think the numbers would probably bear it out if there was some kind of way of, this, of how many immigrants were in each state, let's say that at that point versus if later years, the number of members who were very, very interested and felt almost like a, a constituent based political reason to want to engage in an immigration debate was a lot smaller than, it, than in 96 and then much, much smaller than it is today. Because of the, of the extent of the immigration, which Heather laid out the statistics, uh, is that not exactly at an all-time high, but it's getting there. The immigrants live everywhere, right? So there were very, very, a very much larger member of con members of Congress feel personally um, you know, involved because of what goes on back in their districts. It used to be that you could d defer that to the members that did have a lot of immigrant concerns and, and had a, it was almost like a highway bill or something, you just defer interest to somebody because of a more limited, you know, you're not going to care as much about, um, you know, mass transit funding if you have a rural district, it's right. So now everyone has uh, immigrants, so it's a much more widespread and interested issue. And the other point I'll raise at the risk of turning everyone in this room against immigration is that if you, there's a studies of the Fortune 500 companies over time and how they flip and so on. And there's been a real big increase in the number of uh, Fortune 500 companies that are founded by immigrants or the sons and daughters of immigrants, first generation and, and immigrant generation uh, Fortune 500 companies. They increase economic inequality, guys. Think about it. 
They're so successful, they make so many jobs, they create so much wealth. You know, do you like that or not? I don't know. You may, you may want to rethink that whole economic inequality issue, right? Um, I'd love to speak to something. Um, thank you for uh, kind of tilling uh, this soil, uh, Heather. Um, and actually, um, Michael, because of your hi Irish er heritage, so excuse me for where I'm, the path I'm going down. So my mom, <laughs> my mom's actually an immigrant um, from Italy, and it is interesting in terms of I, I think there's actually a uh, a uh, scripture that says there's nothing new under the sun. And so to Heather's point, um, you know, a lot of the issues that we deal with um, in the country and the world is really is a byproduct of kind of the base elements of human nature and that is you know fear of change fear of outsiders and really it's all in um, in act and preservation of self-interest which is again a, a natural human um, I think reaction to things you're you acting in your own best interest and protecting and um, providing for your family, you know, your friends, your community, all of that. But um, you know, nobody thinks when they think of Italians that those are, you know, these others. You know, it, it, they're considered very much part of the national fabric here. But in fact, you know, in Boston, which is where uh, I was born and my mother immigrated to. Um, they were for many times a very much maligned um, minority population and that was uh, <laughs> due in part <laughs> to the Irish and even you know I recently watched this uh, movie Black Mass about the terrible mobster uh, Whitey Bulger and it was really interesting because I didn't even know the level to which um, ingrained throughout actually the government, you know, the FBI, it became a, a, a Whitey Bulger and the Irish Mafia was enabled in part because of a deal they struck with the Irish members of the FBI and they worked together to take out the Italian Mafia and thus grew their own strength and it was really on a racial basis um, that all of that occurred. Um, so, you know, so again, I think this is something we've been through many times, you know, with every new um, wave. And, and the other thing is just a thought. Um, you know, some of the things that we consider quintessentially American, um, and so the example I'm going to use is the American cowboy, right? I mean, that's something that's instantly recognizable anywhere in the world as being Sometimes so not so positively. Sure. <laughs> but, but even still, you know, even at a costume party or whatnot, you know, a, a square dance, all of these things, right? It's a cowboy, it's American. But do you know that, of course, that's basically an appropriation of the Mexican ranchero, um, the hat, uh, what they you know do in terms of working the land, rounding up cattle, all that—that that really is not so much naturally American as it in the way you know we're talking about today. But in fact, you know, came from the immigrant population that now is the subject of uh, so much of this contentious debate. So there's just you know a thought, um, and uh, so I appreciate you for bringing that up, Heather. <laughs> Um, actually, Mary Linda, you reminded me of something else. My dad grew up in New England, and um, the French Canadians were very much maligned. They were in his, they were the kids you made fun of in yeah. school. So you know, as 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 we you know, sort of as as funny as it seems to be concerned. And of course, it is also the case when you think about border security that we've never caught someone coming over the southern border intending to commit an act of terrorism, uh, we have caught people coming over the northern border. So uh, that's a, a very interesting place to kind of upend the image that many folks seem to have in their minds when they think about, well, what's the problem with border security? Um, so the other just point that we, maybe that it's, it's worth touching on a, a little more explicitly is um, when you look at, and I'm familiar with this data for, for Muslims more than for Hispanics, but um, when you try to break down what are the sources of anti-Muslim sentiment in the U.S., it's this really interesting mix of security fear and economic fear. And it's my opinion that one of the reasons this debate has gotten so awful right now is exactly that, you know, people on the one hand, they're coming here to take our jobs and they're coming here to kill us. And you know that did happen. Someone in one of my other panels this week brought up Sacco and Vanzetti, 
And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sobering thought that even this isn't happening for the first time in our history. And, of course, there were periods where the Irish were similarly viewed with justification, mind you, that they were... Uh... <laughs> Oy vey! <laughs> But, um, you know, imagine if we'd had the terrorism finance laws we have now when um, every Irish pub in America had, uh, had the, the signs for the, you know, re reunite Ireland and here's where you can send money. So, um, but we do live in a time where the addition of the security anxiety to the economic anxiety has made this the, mm, the political fair. issue from hell. All right, well, we'll go ahead and move on on that note to some questions here. And I'm really into the text message questioning, so I'm going to start there. Those came in pretty early, and I'll get to some note cards, hopefully. There will be time. Um, so I, one, one of the first questions that has come in here from a student um, is relating immigration policy to healthcare policy and how immigration may affect healthcare policy. If anyone would like to comment on that from the panel. Well, I guess the, um, the main way it might, be, it might affect it is there is a, um, and this is predates the Affordable Care Act, there is a law called AMTALA, which is a requirement to, for any medical facility, any medical provider who accepts either Medicare or Medicaid money, patients, to uh, sta basically stabilize anyone who shows up, for example, at an emergency room uh, in any hospital in America. So there's a guarantee for level of coverage. People are not intending to, you don't want anyone to die for lack of having, having insurance coverage. And that's been on the law for, I think, 40 plus years. And um, when you have someone who doesn't have any documentation, that's, you know, at the margins, you could have some people who will be getting health care in those venues that might increase cost. And I think some of the economic concerns about immigration that are expressed by certain folks uh, go back, among other things, to both schools and to the health care system and the additional um, cost incurred as a result of that for folks who don't have any other forms of, of coverage and end up sending their kids to local schools. And there's a requirement, Supreme Court law um, a decision, that uh, schools accept um, uh, it'll, it, well, non, non citizens for. Uh, in attendance at K through 12. Yeah, I think it's worth, um, and this is this is a really regional problem that you know there clearly are legitimately parts of the country where there are health services that see an awful lot of people who don't have legal status. There are other parts of the country where that's not in any way, shape, or form a problem, and I think we've struggled quite a bit to figure out how to talk respectfully about the places where it really is a problem for local communities without saying that is a reason to make policy for this whole enormous country of ours. Now having said that, you know, you make people citizens, give them a path to citizenship, it's a lot easier to get them to pay taxes. That helps you grow your, your roles. It also helps put money into the systems that we've now got going under the Affordable Care Act. So where you are having problems, keeping people out of the system is actually not going to help. It's, it's not going to make your health care load less. And we're seeing, um, in general, since immigrants on net overall contribute to the health of the economy, although it is also true, as Michael said, that they exacerbate income inequality. So <laughs> over time, you're going to have you're going to have more. You're, you're going to grow your economy. You're going to grow the pile of money available for healthcare. So the healthcare arguments are going to. I mean, there are some real healthcare issues in specific communities, and it's not useful to deny that they're there. But that is in no way an argument to justify nationally what you what you make your your immigration policy. All right. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into this. Several people have posed questions referencing Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. One of the first being from a student who says, can we say that America is the most welcoming to immigrants when there's people like Donald Trump winning votes by proposing building a wall? How would we like to address that? I'd, I'd actually like to address that, but maybe in a, 
a different way. I mean, first of all, there's no question that there are a lot of things that are said and there uh, cause a lot of people to raise an eyebrow and perhaps two and perhaps more and with good reason. Um, and a lot of concerns about, frankly, um, what you know may occur after uh, this coming November. Um, but it brings me back to thinking, and I think this this is something that uh, would behoove all of us, um, you know, on on either side, whenever we're in, involved in um, you know debate about various policy issues. And so one of one of the things that um, there's been a lot of debate about recently has to do with um, the president's executive orders um, re related to the deferred arrival of um, um, children and parents. And his reason for passing those um, orders, which are of you know questionable constitutionality in terms of the separation of powers and congressional um, authority and whatnot, um, but his reason for that is this gridlock, right? That's his excuse. He says, I need to get something done, et cetera. This is what I'm going to do. And I would argue that one, that is not a motivator when it comes to um, appealing to Congress to actually get something done because that's circumventing them. And so they say, well, if the president's just going to do whatever, then uh, you know, why should we even bother? So it works both ways. But I would encourage uh, people that might be quite supportive of the president taking those actions because perhaps it is in line with uh, their thinking on what should be done in immigration reform, I would encourage you to think if the shoe is on the other foot and you end up with a President uh, Trump and he does in fact, uh, is serious about some of the things he says, well, would you also be supportive of him taking unilateral action and uh, passing, going around Congress and doing what he wants to do on the issue as well? So I just think it would be, it's important that uh, when uh, we consider these things that, you know, everything is cyclical and uh, you can't assume that, uh, you know, people supporting, uh, or excuse me, elected officials supporting the things uh, you um, are in favor of will always be that way. So the rule of law is important. We do have a constitutional republic and I think everyone's interests have served, are served when we respect um, the laws we have and the separation of powers and the appropriate authority within the different branches of government. Okay. Um, one thing that um, with Trump's uh, approach on immigration that I think is worth uh, noting, there's a distinction uh, that sometimes I think might be lost, which is some folks, and I think this is the kind of the norm of, of the immigration um, controversies up until about a year or two ago, were focused more on, let's say, the rule of law aspects of illegal immigration. In other words, they, they could be perfectly, you could be perfectly in favor of a lot of immigration and, and like the idea of having a lot of new blood coming into country and uh, and buying into the American creed and becoming great American uh, citizens. Uh, but you just want it to be fair. You don't want somebody who's playing by the rules and waiting years after year after year to get in to be that people jump in that line, right? And so that's one kind of thought process that could lead to some frustration with illegal immigration. But what's more recent that I'm noticing, Trump's a part, a part of this, uh, I think Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama is part of this, is a sense that not only do they have an animus toward illegal immigration because the law has been broken, it's unfair to those who are playing by the rules, but they're starting to talk about we just have too many immigrants, right? That's a whole separate kind of construct and they're getting to the point where like you want to take a pause or vacation or holiday from immigration and let things settle and so they want to almost go down to zero. I mean, I'm not sure if they say zero, but they think whatever the number is today, a million or so a year is far too high and when the country's not able to absorb all the immigrants and they want to turn that back. That's a whole different uh, and much broader critique of immigration than what I think was preceding it. And just when you hear these debates, I would just encourage you to separate the two out. And one I find to be pretty insidious, the other one you, you kind of get. I mean, you do want laws to be obeyed, um, and you don't want, you know, I, I was, um, uh, when I was moving my mom out of our apartment to come down to D.C. for a nursing home, and I was undoing our, the apartment she was in for 51 years where I grew up, found all the immigration stuff she had, right? And her mother, who had preceded her to America, had to, um, get letters from um, her personal bank 
saying that, that she had resources. She had X amount of money in the bank. She had a mortgage. She was paying on time. And um, so that she would vouch to cover any cost incurred by her daughter coming over uh, to America. And it was very thorough. It was very, you know, detailed, and I think a lot more so than we demand in some ways today. But it was, it was you know, the idea was don't become a burden on the public, you know, fisc. Um, so, you know, today you have this sense that, um, growing sense that we just, immigration's out of control and we have to want to turn the clock back, you know, entirely in that sense. So just, just distinguish that. To more directly answer the question, though, I think that there's something insidious about someone who wants to make a choice to stop legal immigrants because of the religion they believe in. All right. I've got another question here from a student. And I think this is a good general question for us to consider. How does U.S. intervention abroad affect immigration to the U.S.? Um, I guess we could consider you know, military intervention, we could consider economic intervention, things like NAFTA. Um, but do any of the panelists want to speak to that question? Sure. Um, I actually want to start by Michael. My brother-in-law immigrated from the United Kingdom, and I want to assure you that they did everything short of come to the house and check whether his toothbrush was wet to see whether he <laughs> had indeed married my sister. So um, don't worry, they're still, um, they're still, yeah, she had to cancel her honeymoon because he did, couldn't. Did they do a financial site background check too, that kind of thing? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. oh yeah. I mean, you, you have to spend hundreds of, or if not thousands of dollars in lawyer's fees to immigrate, yeah, so, so, so don't worry. Um, so as you can tell from the, um, the three countries I named off um, as the, you know, it, the, uh, U.S. foreign policy is not driving immigration from India and China, and um, we can have we can have an enormous argument about whether U.S. economic policy is or is not driving immigration from Mexico. Something that's interesting is Mexicans tell their own pollsters that their interest in coming here is less than it used to be. Um, the number of Mexicans who say, when asked by pollsters, "Do you want to? Would you live? Would you move to the U.S. if you could?" has fallen um, by more than 10% in recent years. So um, the argument that somehow the U.S. is, is th that there's some kind of continued U.S. economic pressure that is continuously forcing Mexicans to do this, it's a little hard to square that with the data about the choices actual Mexicans are, are making. Now, on the other hand, I live in Washington D.C area and you cannot ignore that we have waves of diaspora, um, each of which brings with them um, cuisine more fabulous than the one before, um, which do tend to be quite closely linked to places that the U.S. Has, has had more active foreign policy in recent years. So my son's school is um, maybe more than 10, maybe 10, 15 percent of the kids are Ethiopian. Um, so um, there's the, the next elementary school up the road is actually one of the biggest recipients of migrant kids from Central America in the country. And unfortunately, it is, there is no question that um, U.S. policy on drugs and also the easy availability of guns from the U.S. in Central America is driving or is part of what's driving, not the only thing that's driving, but it's part of what's driving the epidemic of violence there, which is driving people to think that it's safer to send their little kids through the hazards that Mary Linda referenced than to, to stay there. So um, in terms of the overall picture of U.S. immigration, um, U.S. foreign policy is a, is a rather small factor. Um, you can certainly see its, its impact in, in specific places, but it's not at all, not at all a major driver. All right, next question here, and this is a, a question that a few people have posed, is a question about the intersection of racism, racial discrimination, and immigration policy or anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, one way that this has been phrased, which is the question I'll read verbatim here, is to what extent do you think the current wave of anti-immigrant sentiment is due to the fact that more of the immigrants look different, uh, i.e. not European? Well, um, we already addressed a little bit of this, but I'll remind people, you ever hear of uh, a cartoonist, uh, Thomas Nast? 
famous guy. Well, I remember I did a paper when I was back in college uh, contrasting how he brought down the uh, uh, political machine in New York City back then, Tweed Ring, uh, Boss Tweed, with how uh, her block, he used his uh, political cartoons on Nixon, and it was kind of fun to write. But one thing I was struck by in doing that research and finding books of the uh, Thomas Nass work, you know how, how he depicted Irish people, remember? Like simians, they were, they were apes, right? So there's a long and, and involved history of wh whoever the newest r arrivals are, there's some way you draw distinctions. The, you see the movie uh, Brooklyn this year? Uh, that was scarily, eerily familiar to me because it was like my mom's personal story because she married a Czech, you know, and the, my aunts wouldn't go to the wedding because she was Irish, right? Don't give it away. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, in this case, there is an Irish-Italian uh, thing, but, but tell, Italians are Mediterranean and kind of swarthy, right? And that's a different race, apparently. So the, the point is it's always been there. It goes back way, I mean, probably to the very, very beginning. I'm sure you find can find examples of it um, even in um, the earliest times of our history. I would say um, all of that, but um, also I think within any issue you know that we grapple with, uh, you have to always be mindful of the uh, the confluence effect, if you will. In other words, there's a confluence of factors that drive whatever the uh, public reaction is. And I mean, right now, sure, you know, if, if, if the, the uh, shall we say, you know, very negative and nasty and suspicious and, you know, concerning things that are being said about people that, sure, similar to the Italians, are swarthy and darker and of, you know, Middle Eastern and whatnot descent. Unfortunately, what is our other huge issue that we talk about all the time in the country, this situation with ISIS, right, and terrorism and whatnot. And so there's absolutely no way that you would expect that those two things wouldn't be conflated in the minds of people. So, you know, is it a racist thing? Is it a security concern? Is it really just motivated by fear but coming from two, you know, disparate um, areas, I think um, that, is, that is a factor uh, today. I'll have to say that I, th I think race is certainly a part of it. It's not unique, as, as Michael pointed out, uh, but I think it has to be a factor when the political leaders who are pushing to exclude groups of people uh, their supporters, I think, give truth to the fact that we do not, in fact, live in a post-racial America just because we elected a black man president. All right, so we've got a couple more minutes left. And in the spirit of ending on an optimistic note, I think our last question that we're going to have the panelists field here from the audience is, in what specific ways do the panelists feel like allowing immigration will benefit the United States? No specific immigration, just immigration. generally allowing immigration, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, I kind of like basketball. I spent my whole life playing it, basically. And, and um, I kind of see it as if you if you can recruit the best players for your team, you want to not only have them on the field on your bench, you want to have them in your farm system if you have a farm system. You want to bring as many talented and energetic people to this country as possible, and you want them to have a chance to understand why America is so exceptional and wonderful, and be part of that, and have their children be part of it, and then so on and so forth. So I. I you know, I have l trouble finding what the upward, upper limit is on that, uh, frankly. I, I, and, but you have to do it the right way. And I think that's where it gets back to. You have to serve the long-term national interest of a country and honor our humanitarian traditions in the process of doing so. so. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, I agree. And um, in brief, it's just that it's important. It's obviously beneficial to the country, but as with most things, the details matter. So it's incumbent upon us and those leading our country to work out the details in the way that uh, is in the best interests of the country. 
I happen to think people who are willing to risk their lives and everything they own to try and provide a better future for their children are exactly who we want. Well, it's a real challenge to add anything to those three, but um, because I'm a foreign policy geek, um, you know, we can't cut ourselves off from the rest of the world, and we've seen painfully over and over again in the last decade that there are parts of the world we don't understand well enough. Um, and we have faced some of our greatest challenges in the past and benefited enormously from the insights of recent immigrants who wanted to help our society in its interactions with the societies they had chosen to leave. And so we need, we need more folks here and actively engaged in public life exactly from the societies that we fear the most and have the biggest problems with. Because that's how, not just security-wise, but also economically, and culturally, that's how we're gonna that's how we're gonna do better in, in this century. Thanks to all of our panelists, thanks to you, our lovely audience members. Enjoy the rest of your week here at the Conference on World Affairs. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to give away anything in the movie. What? Oh yeah. <laughs> I just had to stop you before you went any yeah, 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 I know, I <laughs> I know there's an Italian and an Irish involved. Yeah, like I don't know how. I don't know how. I hope you just say it again. <laughs> <laughs>